Hello, my name is Philip Bloom and welcome to my review of this, the Canon C300. You may be wondering where I am and what all this noise is. We have bells, we have horses, we have water, we have traffic. I'm actually in Bruges and I've been road testing the camera. It's a pre-production version of the C300 for the past week. I've been filming in France and I've come here to film this review. Straight off, I just want to say that I've loved shooting with this camera. It's been a real pleasure, both actually operating it and the images that's come out of it. It's great having a camera for a few days rather than just road testing it for a day. I've really got to improve day on day with this camera. So the first day, it was like, uh, what I do with it? Second day, I was getting better. Third day, I was touching it in the dark and knowing exactly where everything was. It was a really pleasurable learning experience. This is not a replacement for the Canon 5D Mark II. I need to make that clear. The replacement for 5D Mark II will still be a DSLR. This is not a DSLR. This is a video camera and you mustn't forget that when looking at this camera. This camera does not do stills. It does video very, very well. Canon were responsible for bringing large sensors into the affordable video market with the 5D, the 7D, the 550D, which is the T2i, et etc. et cetera. And I love those cameras. They do have their issues though, because at the heart of them, they are stills cameras. And the video function is, I wouldn't say it's an afterthought, it's not the main part of the camera. The stills functions are that. But the video out of them is great, but there were many, many image issues and lots of other problems, things like sound and monitoring, etc., etc. They're very well documented. This camera doesn't have those faults. And that's the most important thing about it. I've played with all the cameras in the sort of large video camera category up to a certain price points. And this comes in sort of like the middle ground in that it's not crazy expensive in sort of like the Epics and the Alexas. It's not as cheap as say the AF100, the FS100. It's much more of the F3 price bracket. And so you've got to look at it in that sort of context and, and that's the sort of market that it's going for. So how does it compare with the other cameras and how does it fare on its own merits? If you look at it, it's actually quite a funny camera and it, it's quite small and stumpy and it's quite high with all these bits on, but it is modular. It's not crazy modular in like the FS100 or say a RED, but it is modular in that you can take bits off. So if I take off some of the stuff here, I can show you its most functional stripped down form. Here we go. So with this Canon 24 to 105 lens on, out of the box, I could actually shoot with it, with a, obviously with a battery and a memory card in there. For longer periods of filming, I would prefer to have a rig, but just for real compactness, this is a really nice form factor. And you know something? That's the first time I said that about any of these video cameras. It's an interesting hybrid of the Canon XF series and a DSLR. It has a lot that is very reminiscent of the DSLRs. A lot is very reminiscent of the actual camcorder. It does have the EOS name on it, which means it's got the heritage of the DSLRs. The menus are very similar to the XF. They do two versions of this camera. They do this one here, which is the EF version, which means it takes the Canon lenses. So it'll take EFS and EF lenses, and they do a PL version for your cinema lenses. The only downside is it's one or the other. You can't swap them out. So you do have to choose what is gonna be the one for you. Me personally, I have more use of the EF mount because I have so many Canon EF lenses for my DSLRs. That's why I choose that one. But the PL one is obviously for a different market. In my hand, it feels very reminiscent of a DSLR. I think it's the handle that makes it the most. Uh, you can actually turn it around here and into different positions, but it feels really nice and sturdy here. We have a nice dial here for the actual iris, and we can trigger it, and we have a nice nipple on here for the menu. We all like a nice nipple, and there's one right on the handle. Just to the left of the nipple is a pre-programmed button, which lets us punch in and check our focus, not just before we record, but also whilst recording. It doesn't zoom in as much as the Canon DSLRs, but it does let us check it once we've hit that record button, which we cannot do with those cameras. That's a very useful confidence check for making sure we have our focus once we're rolling. I don't know about you, but I've had many occasions after I've hit record, I'm like, is it in focus? I don't know. And you don't want to stop it, you just hope for the best. And what you often end up doing is just moving that little focus barrel until it goes out of focus and then go, it was in focus, and you put it back to as it was. This gives you that nice ability to check whilst recording. One of the big things about these large chip camcorders is the ability to film in low light situations. This is a great camera when you're shooting in low light. It's very, very, very sensitive. The ISO pushes up all the way to 20,000 ISO, which is really very, very high. The sensor inside is natively rated at 850 ISO. 
It's very clean at 850. And in fact, even if you push it up to 10,000 or so, it still remains pretty damn clean. At 20,000, you're gonna get some noise. You gotta make sure there is some light hitting the sensor. If it's really, really, really dark, you're just gonna see a sea of noise. The noise is quite organic. It is very visible but it's clean noise in that, when I say clean noise, I mean it's not very electronic, it's very organic. And so therefore, if you want to clean it up in post, you can do it. One of the things I've been doing since I had the camera has been testing out that low light and seeing just how good it is. For example, I shot my friend Joel in, a, in my lounge and it was very, very, very dark on his face. And look how much I pump up the ISO and see how much better it looks and how much you can see. When you get something like uh, 12,000 odd ISO, it actually looks really, really nice. Obviously, by the time you get to 20,000 ISO, we do have that noise, but it's, it's working absolutely fine. And as long as there is light hitting that sensor, it'll be fine. For me, a very important function of this camera is it has built-in NDs, very good quality NDs, giving you up to six stops of light reduction inside the camera. It's great because it's actually just an electronic shutter and it flicks them up and down at the touch of a button. It's a great solution for not having to have a bulk, so you can have like a whole filter wheel on there. It's by flicking them up and down, it keeps the camera nice and small. Works a treat. Log is the buzzword of cameras these days. If a camera doesn't have a log recording mode, people go, I don't want that. Well, this has its own gamma curve called C-Log, which works very well. It gives you a very, very flat image. Nowhere near as flat as something like an Alexa or an F3 with its S-Log, that gives you a very flat image. There are loads of other picture profile settings and they can work in conjunction with your Gamma Curve C-Log. But if you want the flattest possible image and the most dynamic range, you want to go into Cinema Lock mode. That will give you a dynamic range of about 12 stops. That's not as much as the F3's S-Log, which is almost 14 stops. It's pretty good for in-camera. It's very intuitive. The buttons are all here. It's easy to find things. The dials are very obvious. There's a lot of programmable buttons on here, which is very useful. I programmed most of these into different things. I mean, you can save those onto an SD card slot so you can transfer it from camera to camera. Very, very useful. I have programmed the buttons on here to make it easier for me, but with say the F3, it's simply a touch of a dial, push it in and you can dial in very easily your speed. It's a lot more fitty. So if you want to get those really fast slow motion shots when filming in much more of a documentary scenario, try and knock off shots fast, it is more fiddly. It records onto nice affordable media, compact flash cards, which work just great, of course, in our 5Ds and 7Ds, etc. You have different ways of recording. You can have it in continuous mode, so it, when it fills up a card in slot A, it goes to slot B, or you can have it recording in dual slots, so whatever it calls on A, it records on B at the same time, so we have a nice backup for peace of mind. Battery life is pretty damn good, I have to say. I only had two batteries with me for the entire shoot, and they, actually, only one day I got to the point where I almost ran out, but I was rolling pretty much solidly. The large battery will give you around 300 minutes. The smaller battery will give you around 200 minutes. I don't know about you, but I've been wanting to use my Canon lenses on these other cameras for quite some time. And the problem is, is just controlling the iris has been really, really tricky. The best Canon mount I've come across, other than actually on Canon cameras, prior to this camera was the Epic, but even with that, it was only giving me the ability to adjust the exposure with one third stop increments. This lets you do it in a much finer way. It's not as smooth as a Cine Iris or like a, a video lens, but you can have it to around seven or eight stop increments, which if you move through it fast enough, it actually is pretty damn smooth. It's only when you do it very slightly is it, is it sort of a bit jumpy. So if you are changing exposure during a shot, you can just about get away with it. That's a first for me when using Canon lenses for video without using something like a variable ND on the front of the lens. What we have here is a handle and the LCD and XLR ports for the camera. The handle also gives us a handle and we can use them on top of each other. And there's a, a couple of cold shoe mounts on here for positioning the LCD screen in different places. It does make the camera a bit bulky when you have them both on. So I've not really been using the handle as such. I've just been putting the LCD plate and panel straight onto the top here. It makes it a little bit smaller than having the handle on there. And I'm just picking it up via the handle like I would with a DSLR. The LCD screen here is actually very good. I understand it's the same quality screen as the XF300. I've not shot with that camera, so I can't say. 
It is a bit reflective though, so if you are going to use it in sunlight, you are going to need to shade it over there. But we have some nice controls in there. We have another nipple, which is always nice. And we have more programmable buttons. We have up to 15 with the ones on the top here, which is very nice. So these redundant buttons in, in recording, which are the playback buttons, can be assigned to really useful shooting functions. Very, very nice. The other thing is when you have this screen up, you have a very nice waveform and vector scope on there. And you can also turn this into different positions to make it suit you. It's very flexible into the position that you want it to be. Now I've been waxing lyrical pretty much about most of these things so far. You're probably thinking, Philip, why don't you just take it up to your room and shag it? Well, to be honest with you, there are some things I don't like about the camera. It's not perfect. In fact, there's quite a few things which bug the crap out of me, but I could probably live with them. First off, the XLRs are only on this handle. We take them off here and we have no sound on the camera. There's no built-in microphone. Then again, the F3 and the FS100 don't have built-in microphones. There is a small 3.5 millimeter port on the side here. We can stick in something like a Rode VideoMic Pro, put it on the cold tune. We have a more compact system here. We do have a headphone jack, which you don't have on DSLRs, and you can control the audio levels within the menu. But if you want XLRs, you've got to have this on top. And for me, that is a bit of a pain. The other thing is, as you can see here, I'm plugging this in and this sends the audio and video detail into the actual screen and also sound back into it. These are hardwired leads into the top here. They're, they're plugs on this end with small pins and I always freak out about small pins, about if they bend or something like that, that's not great. And of course, if that does happen, you have to send the whole thing back for repair. You can't just swap out these leads because they are hardwired. Currently right now, it is 2011. We're almost at 2012. Whilst I'm recording this video, for all I know, you could be in the future watching this video and saying, it's not 2011, it's the year 2025. Why watching this video in 2025? I don't know. But let's get back to the point. The point is, it does 720 slow motion. 720 slow motion, not full HD slow motion. I want full HD slow motion. The 720 mode is nice and you can go up to 60 frames per second because this is a world camera it, and you can have increments all the way down, which is really nice, but it's still not full HD. Side by side, you can tell a difference on fine detail. For other stuff, it's fine, it upscales just great. But as you see in this shot here, which is some detail of Mont Saint-Michel, you can quite clearly see the wall patterning on the 1080 camera, more detailed than the same shot on the 720. Now, of course, why would I shoot a 720 shot of that thing normally? Well, I wouldn't, but it's a shame though, because 1080p, slow motion, where is it? That's the one of the biggest problems for me about this camera. I wish it had it so much. And whilst we're going down this negative Nelly path, the other thing I don't really like about the camera is simply it does 8-bit out. There is no 10-bit. The F3 does 10-bit. The F100 is 8-bit, the FS100 is 8-bit. This camera really, in this price range, should be outputting 10-bit. The difference between 8-bit and 10-bit is much bigger than just 2 bits. It's four times as much color information. Now, obviously, when recording in camera, it's always gonna be 8-bit anyway, but with external recorders that could record 10-bit, having four times as much color information is a big deal, and I really wish it had 10-bit. And as the horse goes past, I'm still nitpicking because you know what? I really wish there was the waveform actually in the EVF. Just shooting without this screen on there, I missed it for exposure. Yes, we have zebras, but it would be so nice to actually have the waveform in here as well. I don't know if that's something that could be fixed in firmware. I hope so. So this is a pre-production camera. I have no idea how weather sealed it actually is. I did err on a side of precaution uh, because it does look like there's loads of places for water to get in. So personally, I would put a weather cover over this if you're gonna film in any bad condition. The 50 megabits per second in camera recording, a 422, is a, a very nice recording rate. Of course, it would be nicer to be high, have the option of going high. You can go lower to 35 megabits per second, but the 50 megabits per second 422 is pretty much a base standard for HD acquisition for a lot of broadcast TV stations. And for me, what makes this really great is its size. I love the fact it's small. You take off all the stuff on the top here, and it's really small. We are not gonna get mistaken for a stills camera. It does look like a video camera still, so you're not gonna be as stealthy as shooting with a DSLR, but I travel so much and I can put this in my luggage, hand luggage, very, very easily. And that's a big thing for me. So in summary, I have really enjoyed shooting with the camera. 
both operationally and working with the footage. The footage is great inside. My editing system works really well. Nice to grade, very simple. Edits natively with Premiere CS 5.5. It's been a real pleasure. Operationally, I've got to know the camera very well, very fast, and that's a sign of a really nice camera to use. This camera won't make me swear when I'm shooting with it. It will make it very easy to actually find the things, and I like that a lot about the actual camera. And of course, I love the image. Yes, the downsides are there. I wish it had XLRs actually on the body. I wish it had 1080p slow motion, and I wish it had 10-bit output. I don't want the world. I don't want crazy slow motion, other things like that. But just full HD slow motion would have been really nice and 10 bit. They're the two things which I'm missing most about the camera. But take those aside and look at the camera as a whole. I think it's a very, very nice camera and something I can imagine using a lot. Do I want one? Absolutely. Mm -hmm.